Well, I want to welcome everybody for coming. This is an event I have been looking forward to for a while. My name is Nicole Willard. I'm a senior director here at the library. I oversee the archives and special collections, and then I manage uh, development and communications. And this is really part of my job as archives and special collections, because uh, for Women's History Month, we decided to do uh, an exhibit on women's sports, and I reached out to Dr. Peters, and I said, would you be willing to talk about what it was like here when Title IX was passed? And she emailed back and she said, well, how would you like two for one? I said, love it, love two for one. And so, because she says, you know, really, uh, Title IX was passed in 72, and really it was Jerry who was here for a lot of the implementation uh, that ha occurred, right? If I say something wrong here, please correct me. Uh, so that's what we're going to get today. We're going to sort of get the before and the after, and Virginia's going to sort of give us the before, and uh, Jerry's going to give us the after. Uh, but before we get started, I want to say some thank yous. I want to thank uh, Habib Tabtabiyi. He is our executive director here in the library, and he supports and sanctions everything we do. I also want to thank um, my archives team, Oliver Ellington, Brooke Leffler and Diane Rice. And then uh, my advancement communications team, Jeff Musselwhite, he always slips away. Oh, there he is, okay. And uh, Amaya Stevens in, and Cassidy back there. And I wanna acknowledge Art Cotton here. Art, yes, there he is. By VPR of our foundation, thank you for coming. I wanna acknowledge Donna Cobb. Thank you for coming. And everybody, thank you so much for coming. I'm just, as I said, thrilled uh, to, to be capturing this. That's something else I want to let you know about. We are recording this. So if you have a penchant for not being recorded, you might want to slip to the back. But um, I am just thrilled that we're recording this. It will be made fairly quickly available after the show, and we'll put a link on our website, so anybody that wants to view it can, but I just know that in 100 years, there's gonna be a bunch of kids who are so glad that we did this. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't it be cool if we had Emma Plunkett doing this? With, with Richard Thatcher, right? Or somebody, yeah, yeah, who's that? So, um, so I'm really excited about this. Um, I would introduce Dr. Peters, and Dr. Pinkston, but I'm sure you know them, and they told me that they would prefer to introduce themselves. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to them, and I'm gonna let them do their thing. I think it'll be very entertaining, and then after they're done speaking, we'll open it up for questions, and then food. So, thank you. Thank you. Testing, testing. Well, I'm Virginia Peters. In 1953, I graduated from high school in Drumright, Oklahoma, where I played four years of basketball on the girls' basketball team. That was the only sport that was offered for girls at my school, basketball. We played a schedule of 25 plus games, plus district and regional and state tournaments. So we had inner school sports in those days for basketball anyway. 1957, I graduated from Central State College, now UCO, where I competed for four years on the intercollegiate teams of field hockey, volleyball, basketball, and swimming. 1958, I became a faculty member and a coach here at Central. I taught in the Department of Health and Physical Education for women, and I coached the women's intercollegiate teams. During my 34 years at Central, I served as a teacher and a coach, as chair of the HPE department, coordinator of women's intercollegiate sports. My personal history with sports as a player and a coach covered 33 years, from 1950 to 1983. I retired from Central in 1992. My colleague. Oh, you have your own mic. I'm just a tag along, you all know that. <laughs> I'm Jerry Pinkston. Um, in 1966, I graduated from Chickasha, Oklahoma High School. Uh, there was only one sport for women, and that was tennis. So I went out for tennis. My brothers could have played about six sports. They had six sports offered, at least, for men. Um, and then I went to Oklahoma State University and graduated in 1970. 
I thought the first day I stepped on campus that I died and gone to women's sports heaven because there were 10 women's sports that we could play. And so I played seven of those. Now, that wasn't every year. I did about four years of field hockey and four years of volleyball, but I only did one year of basketball and one year of you know, tennis anyway. So I didn't do those all that time, but I did do seven sports by the time it was finished. We did get to go to the first ever national badminton tournament in New Orleans, and the school flew us there. And I got to go to the first ever national women's track meet, and we got to go to Texas one year, and then to um, Illinois, I think it was, the, the next year. So those were kind of exciting times. <clears throat> Uh, in 1975 is when I became a faculty member here uh, in the health, physical education, recreation, and dance department. <clears throat> um, I coached volleyball for three, excuse me, for eight years, badminton three years, tennis one year, and softball for 22 years. I retired from coaching side of my job after 22 years in 1997. <clears throat> and I continued to teach in the department, and I coordinated the um, uh, teacher ed program and also the graduate program, and uh, retired fully in 2006. So I've been retired about 18 years. We're old. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Okay, now, Jerry, that we know who we are and who we were, and our connection to today's topic. Let's begin with a brief look at the past. We can't very well talk about what happened with Title IX unless you know what was going on before Title IX, okay? So we're gonna do a little brief history of the Women's Intercollegiate Sports Program here at Central. I'm not going back as far as 1903 with the first basketball <laughs> game, but I did find that, no. Uh, I'm going to talk about from 1928 to 1949. I was not here in those years. But during that time, we had what were called state play days. And the first one was held at OU in 1928. Now, a play day was where athletes from different schools went to one location at one school, and they were divided up, and they played on the same team. So on one team, you might have someone from Central, someone from OU, someone from OSU, and they had to divide you into color teams. So, so the emphasis there was on playing together rather than playing against each other. We all got to go and we meet people from other schools, always a little social afterwards. Uh, so they were working on our, on our social skills too as they were doing that. Okay, then from 1949 to 1959, those play days became what we called sports days. Now players competed on their team, their school's team, against teams from other schools, more like what real athletics is about. So the sports days we held each year were field hockey sports day, volleyball sports day, basketball sports day, and individual sports day. When we went to individual sports day, we took usually 18 players, and so some were tennis players, some were badminton, some were swimmers, uh, some were golf, some were bowlers, some were archeries. So you took all the people with the individual sports skills and went one day and competed against the other teams. Now, uh, teams, the team sports in those days competed in uh, more like round robin uh, tournaments. You went and you had maybe three or four games in one day at, the, at volleyball sports day, say, and then that was it for the season. There wasn't anything else any other time that you played. Uh, we had a win-loss record, but we didn't declare, it wasn't good to declare champions, they said in those days. We were not going to declare champions, we were just going to say, isn't that good? But you know what? All those girls that played on those teams figured out on the bus on the way coming home. <laughs> how, who had how many wins and how many losses? And so in their minds, we had champions. Okay, during the 1960s, those OARs, well, those sports days continued. I just started to give you a bunch of initials. but. On each campus, we had a WRA. That was a Women's Recreation Association. The WRAs belonged to the state. Uh, Oklahoma, uh, it's too long. Oklahoma Association Recreation Federation of College Women. Okay, lots of initials. That was our group. We had 12 colleges that played in those tournaments, senior colleges. And now the, ch the play changed from the round robin to actual championship tournaments. So we had, we went 
you had a consolation bracket and a winner's bracket and ch changed the whole emphasis there. But after the sport, state tournament, there was no opportunity to go on. There was no regional, there was no uh, national tournament of any kind. It was just through, through the years. Okay, in 1963, uh, a National Institute of Girls and Women's Sports was held down at OU. What was its purpose? Its purpose was to increase experience and opportunities for women's sports. That was the whole purpose. At that time, Oklahoma colleges also began having other competitions in addition to the sports days. So we're close, we might have a home and home with Bethany of Central, because it's easy to go back and forth like that, okay? And then we went to more, schools had invitational tournaments. So Central might have an invitational volleyball tournament and just invite four or five schools close by, okay? And then a few invitational out-of-state competitions mostly in Texas and Kansas. You know, we didn't go too far, but we began to get out of, the, out of the state a little bit. Okay, that's a brief look at the women's intercollegiate sports in the 50s and the 60s. So Jerry, why don't you tell us what it was like in the 70s when you came to Central? Well, in 1974, 75, I was actually getting my master's degree here. I was a volunteer graduate assistant in volleyball, basketball, and softball. And then upon receiving my master's, I was hired to teach and coach here full time. Uh, most of the things during my time in the beginning were very much as Virginia has described, although by then we were more playing state tournaments, not individual or sports days. <clears throat> um, the sports that we competed in, there were 10 of them here, and that was field hockey, volleyball, gymnastics, basketball, swimming, badminton, track, tennis, softball, and fencing. So there were 10 sports. Title IX was passed in 1972, just two years before I came to Central. It was uh, last known as uh, Title IX. It was an educational amendment to the Constitution. So Virginia's going to tell you all now what Title IX actually said so that you'll, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, you'll have an idea of what Title IX is. It was a long time ago. Can you believe how long ago it was, 1972? That's a long time ago. How much? Uh -huh. 52 years. Mm -hmm. She was born. She was born a year before. <laughs> We had a celeb there were there were lots of celebrations all across the country two years ago about the 50-year 50 50 year anniversary. anniversary. Okay, so Title IX was an Educational Amendment Act that was part of a federal civil rights law that was passed in 1972. Its purpose was to protect people from discrimination based on gender in education programs or in activities that receive federal um, financial assistance, okay. <clears throat> One of the main implications in it was reference to athletic programs in colleges and universities. So at UCO, that meant there should be no discrimination based on gender in our athletic program. Now, there were three main mandates of Title IX, three things that you required. It required equal opportunities for males and females to participate in sports. Equal opportunity for participation. It's a hard word to say, for participation. Athletic programs did not have to offer identical sports, but they had to offer males and females an equal opportunity to play, to play a sport. It didn't require that the amount of money had to be spent the same for men and women, but that adequate amounts had to be provided for both of those. Okay, so first one, equal opportunity to play. The second one was required that female and male student athletes must receive athletic scholarship dollars proportionate to their participation. That's an important phase, proportionate to their participation. They didn't have to be the same number of scholarships for males and females, didn't have to be the same amount of money for scholarships for males and females, but the number of scholarships and the amount of scholarship money had to be proportionate to the number of male and females who are participating. So the first one was opportunity to play, to participate. The second one had to do with scholarships. The third one required that there had to be equitable conditions for men and women athletes in several, like 10, clearly defined uh, specific areas. 
And some of those areas were this. You had to have equal competition, equal conditions <clears throat> for practice and competitive facilities, equipment, supplies, uniforms, coaching, transportation to scheduled events, medical and training facilities and service, and publicity. Now we're gonna go through those very briefly and so you'll have a chance, those of you who are taking notes for your A in class or whatever that is. Okay, Title IX said that in, uh, adherence to these requirements had to be met by 1978. Now, back up, when was it passed? 1972. They didn't have to be in compliance until 1978. So you know what happened? Not many of them were in compliance. As part of that is they were waiting for the guidelines to come out so they knew exactly what they needed to do. And the other part is we don't have to do it yet. And it's gonna be hard and so we'll just wait as long as we can before we have to do it. Uh, a lot of schools waited until the interpretation of the law was published before they began working on compliance. So there were no major impacts on men and women's athletic program for several years. The first order of business was to determine where there were differences in the men's and women's programs in each of those areas I said. So where were there differences in participation, in uh, scholarships, in amount of money spent, and so on. Okay, so now the, uh, well, let's see. Am I through? Are yeah. you through? You're through. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even practiced this, see? This is, we don't do this like we used to. We're, so we're used so to. now that we've had a brief history and also yeah, the explanation right. of what Title IX is, we're going to give you the different specific aspects. I would like to briefly um, say ahead of time, I hope you don't get the idea that we hate men. Uh, it's just that in our days, men were the college presidents, they were the athletic directors, they were the people that were in charge. So we were always having to go in to men administrators. So you'll hear a little bit of angry in our voice. <laughs> anyway, Virginia's gonna talk now, we're gonna start with facilities. Okay, so one of the first things you heard me say was we had to have uh, practice and competitive facilities that were uh, reasonable and, and okay for both men and women. Now, Wantman Hall opened in 1928. I was not at the dedication. <laughs> both men and women used Wantman Hall for physical education classes and for intercollegiate sports practices and competition. It was a one facility on campus. We, we all lived together in that same house and we uh, had our classes there and we had uh, our comp competitions there. Bronco Fieldhouse opened in 1965. 1928, 1965. Well, men's physical education classes and, and uh, men's athletics moved to the Fieldhouse, to the Bronco Fieldhouse, the new building. Women's physical education classes and sports stayed at Wantland Hall. And that's, that happened on a lot of campuses. If they got a new facility, that's the way it went. Men's swimming classes were held uh, in the new Bronco Fieldhouse swimming pool, had a new pool there. The co-ed classes and the women's swim classes and the women's swimming team still use the old pool in Wantland Hall. Women's volleyball and basketball teams practiced and played their games in Wantland Hall. Men's basketball and wrestling practiced and had their games and matches in the field house. We had sports at that time, those individual sports I mentioned to you, archery, badminton, gymnastics, and fencing teams practiced and played in Wantlin Hall. And it's interesting because on the fencing teams, I did have men. So, so there were co-ed classes that were still in Wantlin Hall. A new football stadium was built in 1965, and there was a practice football field near there. Women's field hockey was played for a while on the old football field and then on an improvised field on the edge of campus. A new baseball stadium was built in 1966. It was a lot of things in the 60s, in the mid 60s of new facilities, okay. Men's and women's uh, classes and varsity practices and competitions were held on the campus tennis court, both men and women, okay. And the track, both men and women used the track that we had on campus. We had bowling and golf classes and intercollegiate teams, and they used the uh, facilities in Edmond, the public, the Edmond Bowling Lanes 
uh, you know, uh, and the golf course. Okay, now trying to move women's intercollegiate sports practices and games to the Bronco Fieldhouse was not an easy thing to do. Uh, I was trying to get mo women's basketball moved over there to the field house. We even had coaches from other schools who said, why do we have to come up here and play in Wantlin Hall when you got this brand new field house? That's ridiculous. I said, go tell the athletic director. Go tell the athletic director. And so a couple of good men coaches, friends from other schools said to our athletic director, this is crazy. We're not going to do this anymore if we can't play in the field. So he said, okay, okay. <laughs> but he said to me, but you can't practice there. The men use the afternoon to practice basketball, so you, you can't practice there. So behind his back, I went to the men's basketball coach, and I said, <laughs> how long does it take you to practice, you know, to get a good practice in? He said, two hours. If you can't do it in two hours, you can't do it, Virginia. I said, okay, well, how about we split that four-hour shift in the afternoon? You know, you do two hours, we'll do two hours. Will that work? Of course that'll work. He said, you take whichever one you want. You take one to three, and, and we'll take three to five or whatever. You do it. So I went back to the athletic director, and I said, we've worked this out now, and so it's okay, and we'll be over and everything. He said, no. I said, why not? And he said, the men have always practiced from two to four. It is traditional. <laughs> so I went to the president's office. <laughs> and we started practicing over at the field house as well as playing our games. So <laughs> we had to fight battles, you know. And these were good friends that we still have in all this battle. Okay. Dr. Beeston. Well, it gives you an idea of what we were always having to do. And, and lots of time got told no, and we just had to kind of keep pushing the best way we could. And I do want to say, you know, the men coaches that I coached with were wonderful. We, got, we have great relationships even to this day. So like I said, it's, we're not anti-men. It's just that, you know, we had administrators that we had to fight through. <clears throat> Anyway, I'm going to kind of talk more about the sports I coach, so there's a lot more probably that have been going on. But um, in volleyball and badminton, she's already mentioned to you that, that we played our competitions in uh, Wantland Hall. In 1978, we dropped some sports, and we're going to come back and talk about that a little bit. So badminton was dropped in 78. Um, and then I was uh, eventually, after six years, I went to coach in softball year round. We all went to kind of year round sports eventually. And before I tell you a little bit about the facilities, a funny quick story in Wantland Hall, uh, those of us that, that practiced outdoors, sometimes when we had bad weather, we needed a place to go practice. And so I had gone in and asked Dr. Peters, could we come into Wantland Hall to practice? So one day, when we were over there, and the kids today still have great memories of this day, they will tell you it's a day they will never forget because the, ten, well, the gymnastics team was the one that was actually um, uh, practicing, and because we were coming in, they moved over to half of Wantland Hall. So they moved their uneven bars and their balance beam over to one half of Wantland Hall, and then we dropped down uh, a partition to separate us the track team came in and they were running upstairs to get their running in. And downstairs on the other half of the gym, uh, Dr. Black at that time was coaching tennis and she had the tennis team with a ball machine and sh she was feeding the ball machine and it was going out and the tennis players were hitting it back to my softball players <laughs> who were fielding the tennis balls. So. That day, four teams practiced in <laughs> Wantland Hall, <laughs> and, and it really was fun. I mean, it, I cannot imagine teams today doing anything like that, but it was a great, a great time, a great day. Well, we started in softball. We were in a facility over at Barnett Field. Barnett Field is over on the west side of Edmond. It's now a splash park, but we were over there. Um, we had nothing other than the field. Um, we had no storage building. All of the equipment was in my car, and I'm talking bats, balls, helmets, 
bases, a pitching machine, a gasoline generator, and a drag. Uh, that was in my car for many years, by the way. Um, we had to pick up trash can, I mean, excuse me, we had to pick up beer cans and trash before we could practice when we got out there. Uh, the maintenance of the field was done by the city of Edmond, so anytime we had a game, I had to call them and say, will you please get the field mowed uh, so that we can have a game this afternoon. The, our girls had, I don't know how many are familiar with softball, but the infield in softball is what we call skinned, so it's an all dirt infield and the outfield is grass. Uh, we had to use what we call a drag that we would smooth out the field before play. So uh, my girls at Barnett Field had to hand drag the field. So they pulled the drag and then one day one of my players got a Volkswagen bug and she came to me and said, <laughs> Coach, do you think we could drag the field with my car? And I said, do it. <laughs> so we started dragging the field every day by hooking it up to uh, her car. It's kind of funny because now, in, in retrospect, I go down to the Sopa Hall of Fame Stadium and they still have a dirt infield that they use at the Hall of Fame, the, the, ninest, the biggest, nicest facility in the country. The men come out about halfway through a game with four little hand drags and four men are hand dragging the field. So it kind of brings back memories and I think it's kind of funny that it's the men doing it. <coughs> we had a very small scoreboard um, uh, and, and the girls had to change their clothes in their cars. There was no place for them to change their cars, no locker rooms or anything like that. Meanwhile, all this time, the baseball team was on campus in a very nice baseball facility with a storage um, uh, compartment and, and press box. They had a big scoreboard. They had batter and pitcher warm-up areas. Um, so they had quite a bit of stuff that we certainly didn't have. And in 1978, Dr. Peters said, we're going to bring you all to campus. So the place where the suites are right now it used to be a block long and wide uh, intramural field. So that's where we moved to right across from the 7-Eleven, which became the girls locker room, by the way, because that's where they would go to the bathroom and change clothes. Uh, or even in between games, they would run over there to go to the bathroom. Uh, but we moved there and Basically, the, the maintenance department here skinned the infield for us. And because we weren't year-round at the time, so we only played in the spring, they would just come and put what's called a snow fence up for the outfield. Um, they did put a, a bench behind third base and behind first base side so we could kind of have a dugout. And at one, somewhere along the line, they brought in some poles and actually fenced that area in. So we had a little bit of a fenced in area for a dugout, no roof uh, or anything like that, but we sort of had an out, I mean, a, a dugout. Uh, we used flip cards for scoring. Um, I went down with some cookies to the maintenance department and asked them if they had any, any kind of a vehicle we could use to drag the field. And so they went and found an old broken down riding mower and took the mower blade off and that's what we used to drag our field. But hey, we got a vehicle. So I eventually, I went to um, our athletic director uh, who wanted nothing to do with women's sports at the time, but I went to him and I, I asked if there was any way, I was about ready to go buy my first ever brand new car. So I didn't want all that stuff in the trunk of my car. So I went to the athletic director and I said, is there any way that we could get a storage building built now here? And he said, hell no, we don't have any money. So I said, okay. So I leave. About three weeks later, I was walking across campus and I was over here by the administration building. Ran into the vice president of administration and he was just saying, how are things going, and so on. And I said, could I, could I show you the trunk of my car? And I said, because I'm getting ready to buy a new car. I said, I have asked for a building. We've been on campus, I don't know how long by then, three or four or five years. 
I said, and I still have equipment in the trunk of, trunk of my car, would you come look? And he came and, and I raised the trunk of my car and he said, oh my God. <laughs> he said, you will have a building. And I think uh, within about a month, they started, they came out and started building a block building. So we finally did get our building. Um, little by little, we got some improvements on that field because um, I kept trying to ask for it. Um, some of the baseball guys, you know, they're, they're used to working on fields and things, so they kind of built some things along the way themselves. Um, but we just didn't have the, the means to do that. Near the, I think we were on that field about 14 years. And in 1994, President George Nye came and said to me, Jerry, we're gonna have to build suites over here on this corner, so we're gonna have to move your softball field. And he said, but we're gonna move it, and, and it's, it, he moved it to the current location where the softball field is right now. I will tell you that George Nye had a daughter who played softball, George Ann Nye. She played softball with some of my softball players who played in the summers. George Nye sent a gentleman over and he said, tell us what you want. That was one of the first times I had ever been asked, what do you want, you know? So I actually got to give input to, to him and they did, they moved us to that field. They put in block dugouts with a real nice roof over our heads. They put shelves in the, in the uh, dugouts. We actually even had a sprinkler system uh, that would come on and water the field, and it did come on one time during the middle of one of our games. We had to scramble to get it shut off. Um, but like I said, we had by the, and, and we had a storage area. We had a press box. You know, we had a lot of the new amenities, all because of George and I. We had a scoreboard. It was it was not a huge one, but but somebody <laughs> went to um, the president of the bank at. Um, I think it was the Citizens Bank here, and he donated a scoreboard, so we got a better scoreboard. Um, now, I don't know if you've been over there, but now there's a stadium, and it has artificial turf, and it has, all, it has lights. I mean, we've come a long way. We've, it's got large dugouts, warm-up areas, a clubhouse for coaches and offices. My office was actually over in the field house. Shared it, shared it with, when, when we moved, my office originally was in Walton Hall, had to move to the field house so that all the coaches, me being the only female, were over in the field house. And um, so I officed there and, until something happened a little later that I'll be telling you about. But because of this new facility that we have now, it's kind of interesting, it took us all those years to get it. Within two years of the completion of the new stadium, the baseball guys said, oh, we don't have a clubhouse out here. We don't have coaches' offices. Within two years, that was upgraded to match, almost match the softball stadium. So anyway, I'm done with that facility. <laughs> The thing you need to know, if you don't know, is that that new stadium is named Jerry Pinkston Softball Stadium. <laughs> If you live long enough, sometimes <laughs> things happen like that. Or you cause enough trouble. <laughs> I'm kind of like that gentleman, the senator, that said he was always in good trouble. So I think I was always in good trouble. He didn't think so, but I did. Okay, so the next area has to do with equipment. So what was going on before Title IX? Well, early on, the Women's Physical Education Department provided all the equipment for women's intercollegiate sports for the classes and also for the teams. So, you know, for softball, that meant balls and bats and gloves and bases. And for field hockey, that meant sticks and shin guards and balls and goalie pads. And for archery, bows and arrows and targets. And also provided were the basketballs and the volleyballs, along with the volleyball nets and the net poles, coming out of the physical education budget, uh, the women's physical education budget. Some individual sport athletes like tennis, and bowling and golf owned and provided their own equipment. 
So the bowlers already were bowlers, and so they had the bowling balls, you know, and the tennis players had the tennis rackets and so on. At first, there was no specific budget for women's athletics. We had a little hunk in the middle of the women's physical education uh, budget that we used for that. Now later, there was a section of the women's physical education budget that was specifically designated for women's athletics, and the equipment was paid for out of that section. What about after Title IX? Well, for the most part, we always had bats, balls, bases, the drag, which is an old piece of fence that we kind of had a dad hook some things on. Uh, along the way, we did have to wear, I mean, to add helmets, batting helmets. Uh, that was a requirement. Um, we did a order, I had a, some extra money one year that I did get to order a pitching machine and a gas generator, as I mentioned. Um, again, all of those stayed in the trunk of my car for quite a while. Ladies did provide their own shoes, they used to, and their own gloves, so usually the school had the rest. Um, but now you will see, if you go to a game, you'll see that even some defensive players are wearing face guards because the ball comes back so quickly that they can get hurt, especially pitchers, you'll see them with face guards. Um, now many of the teams get their shoes as part of their equipment. Um, some of the schools actually have a deal with companies that provide those things so that they can advertise, you know, who they are. Um, at some Division I college school, I mean university schools, uh, they actually have suppliers of gloves. So sometimes the girls are not even having to provide their own gloves. They get them given to them by a supplier and they're actually in their school colors. So you might be seeing some of that. There's a lot of high technology things that are going on right now that they didn't, we used to, I used to give signals the old way, you know, we would hit different places in our body like the baseball coaches do and that's how we would give signals to the batter so they would know what to do. Um, now they have digital, um, that look like digital wristwatches that the coaches can send signals to the batters on these digital wristwatches. Uh, you might also see in between there, you'll see uh, teams, and, and at our level, the Division II level, you'll see wristbands that have a whole bunch, they have cards on them with a whole bunch of numbers. So the coach, instead of giving signals by touching different places of their body, will give a one or a five or a three or something like that, and that's the signal to the batter. One time, Dr. Peters, I was sick and she took my place. I swear she was given the Catholic sign of the cross <laughs> for signals. <laughs> But the funny thing about that was the assistant coach on the other team went to the head coach and said, I picked up her signals. Coach, I know what, she's, I know what they're going to do. I didn't know what I was doing. There are also uh, cameras that do record the speed of pitches. There are now clocks you, you might see on TV if you watch softball. In the back stop is now a clock that's a 20-second clock, and it's timing the pitchers because they're trying to speed up the game a little bit. Um, our catcher has a little battery pack on her catcher's protector and, an, and a deal that goes into her ear. And so the pitching coach is giving her signals as to what pitch to call. Um, and I will say that because of our stadium, the MIAA, which is our conference, they have selected our school to do what is now called a review. It's called a, a review system of umpires' calls. So, and, and for the first time this last weekend, because it was conference games that the girls played, we got to use that review system. And believe it or not, it did reverse the call of a couple of the umpires' calls. They, they've been doing that in Division I for a couple of years now at least, but we're just now getting it, as always, trickled down to our level. Uh, but it does make the umpire's calls more accurate now. That's it. <laughs> Wait till you hear this next one. This is about uniforms. In the beginning, uh, the women athletes were to pr provide their own white shorts and white shirts and their own tennis shoes. and. Socks had to provide that, everything, okay. Now, the university, the, the college at that time, 
provided what we call target jerseys. I don't know if you know what that is, but they look kind of like a man's undershirt. I mean, they're sleeveless, sleeveless things, you know, that cover here in front. Some of the other schools that were called, were called pennies. They had little things went over their head and they tied on each side. And that's how you, you know, you, we had a gold set of gold ones and a set of blue ones. And so depending on what was going on, we could, we could make a choice there. They were used for physical education classes as well as for the sports teams, the athletic teams. So later we purchased two sets of those Target jerseys just for the girls' sports teams. So we didn't have to use the physical education ones. And at one point we even inherited some hand-me-down jackets from the track team. So the men got some new track things and so they gave us, war so we had warm-up jackets. The first set of team uniforms that we purchased and we were so excited. It was purchased from the Broderick Gymware Company. Now that immediately puts a little flag up because you know most sports uniforms are not produced by a gymware company. They were dark blue. They were trimmed in gold and white. They were made of a thick double knit material. You'll see why. We only had one set. So they were used for field hockey and then for volleyball and then for basketball, and then for softball. One set of uniforms. At first that worked okay, because only one sport was going on at a time. After we got, we were having two sports, the field hockey and volleyball were going on at the same time. We had to schedule the games on different days. So field hockey played game, get the, get the uniforms to the coach of the volleyball team, they wash them, get them ready, then they play the volleyball, then they hand them back to field hockey. Can you imagine doing that? And those old thick, uniforms were so durable that we did that for several years. We could pass them back and forth like that. Then later we had a larger budget. We could purchase uh, separate uniforms for each of the teams. We had some students at one point that said, those uniforms had the sweat of a thousand women. <laughs> You know, they managed. They, had, they were proud that we had a uniform and we didn't have to just do those other things. So now the, the uh, individual sports people who competed in individual sports early on provided their own uniform. So it, the swimmers wore their own swimming suit. The gymnasts wore their own tights and, and leotards and the, and the tennis girls had little tennis dresses, so on. Now what about after Title IX? Well, before I say that, I want to say that I want you to know that women did not know what we didn't have, so all of us who competed were just so happy to get to play, just so happy to get to be out there, that even though we, some of us, had to fight along the way, we were just happy to be, it's kind of like kids that'll go out and find a grass field and they'll say this trash can is the sideline and so on and they played because they just wanted to play for fun that's all it was we just wanted to play and so but but along the way we started realizing differences and a lot of my parents and grandparents of my athletes are the ones that came to me and said why doesn't my granddaughter have the same facilities my grandson why don't they have the same uniforms that kind of thing that's what prompted us to keep pushing and we'll get to some of that a little bit later. In the early 80s in softball, we did get one real nice set of uniforms, and we even had jackets so that when we went places, you know, the girls had jackets to put on because we did play in some cold environments. We used to play two to three games a day if we went away to a tournament, so we'd be playing two or three games in one day, and then we'd turn around and play the next day. So I found that, you know, I'd grab a manager, we'd go, say, to Pittsburgh, Kansas, we'd play our three games, and then I'd get them settled in the hotel room and fed, and then the manager and I would go to the laundromat and wash the uniforms so that we would have them ready for the next day. So that's kind of how. Finally, you know, we got a budget where we could buy our second set of uniforms. So for quite a while, we were able to use two sets of uniforms. They were really nice, you know, uniforms. We were pretty proud and, and so on. Um, there, today, I talked with Coach White uh, a couple weeks ago and was catching up with some of the things that are going on now. They have five sets of uniforms 
they can wear them the way they came or they can interchange them in lots of different ways. They have travel bags, they have jackets, they have all kinds of things now and, and I'm sure that is true in other sports, not just softball. But um, and, and he did tell me that this past year there was a gentleman who donated a pretty good amount of money to football and he had some money left over and he came and he said to our athletic director, tell me another winning team on campus. I want to donate to a winning team. And the athletic director said, well, the softball team's been doing pretty good. So he said, I want to donate a set of uniforms. So they have brand new set of uniforms this year that were donated by a, a nice giving person. Okay, the next area is health, medical, and athletic trainers. Before Title IX, the policies and the practices uh, concerning women's athletics in this area were as follows. Number one, women athletes had to be covered by their own accidental insurance. The university did not provide insurance for the athletes. Two, women athletes had to have a physical exam within the last year, have a physician's permission to play intercollegiate sports, and the physician had to notify the coach about any physical problems that the coach should be aware of. We did a lot really protecting, protecting, trying to, okay. Number three, there was a form that had to be completed by every women athlete with the doctor's permission and the parent's permission to participate. Also had other information. A first aid kit had to be present at all practices and games. Sometimes there was a cardboard box with a roll of tape and a, some band-aids in it, you know? But it was a first aid kit. And the coach or the student manager evaluated and treated the injuries. And then afterwards, if it was too serious, a physician from the student health center, we had a student health center, was consulted. The athlete had to go and let that physician look them over and see if it was everything was taken care of okay. Now, there were not any athletic trainers for women's sports. Women were not allowed to utilize the athletic trainers, the training room, or the training supplies of the men's athletic department. After Title IX. <laughs> Um, in the years that I coached, uh, and I will preface this too by saying we didn't have assistant coaches. I want you all to realize we, 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 only, we coached and we did it all. We did a lot of stuff. Anyway, so we didn't have trainers. Luckily, I taught anatomy and I taught the care and prevention of athletic injuries. So I think I probably had a little more knowledge than the average coach about dealing with injuries. <clears throat> um, we... At one point, uh, we had an injury, uh, a pretty serious injury at OBU where one of my players was hit in the eye. And um, so again, no assistant coaches. They don't, sometimes I just had to rely on some parents, you know, and luckily her dad was here. And luckily the, the um, hospital was across the street. So dad had to take the player while we finished the games, you know, to be taken care of. She had a serious eye injury that had to come back and take care of that, and she was in bed for two days uh, until that healed. We had a, another injury that um, here in, on one of our fields, uh, one of the opponents slid into one of my players and it broke her jaw. And again, I had to ask one of the parents to take her to the hospital while we finished the game. Then after the game, I went straight to the hospital. She was in surgery, had her jaws wired, wired shut for six weeks. Uh, and funny story there is her roommate, she used to be the, um, I guess the heckler of her people that she lived with. And all during those six weeks, she had her jaws wired shut. They ate things like steak and baked potato <laughs> to get back at her. The third time, uh, we were in Pittsburgh, Kansas. And again, um, my shortstop was making a play, and she broke her leg. And uh, Pittsburgh, Kansas did not have an orthopedic surgeon at their hospital. We had to caravan to Joplin, Missouri that night. And before all that happened, while I'm holding the girl's leg and the grandparents going to get the ambulance, because we didn't have cell phones at the time, so I'm holding her leg and the ambulance comes. And, and just as the ambulance people took over, I stood up and one of my players fainted. So I had to go take care of her. And as soon as we took care of her, they said, Linda's overthrowing up at the fence. 
Um, so I had to go take care of her. Anyway, we got everybody loaded in the, in the vans and off to Joplin. When I get to Joplin, they said, you left two of your players back in Pittsburgh. <laughs> it was called My Night from Hell. <laughs> anyway, the great thing is, um, one day, Jeff McKibben, who is the athletic trainer, the head trainer, he came by and he said, Jerry, would you be interested in us providing a student trainer? Would you, would you like that? Because we will provide them at your practices. They can travel with you. And I said, thank you, Lord. Uh, because that was one responsibility that was lifted off of my shoulders, and it was a godsend. Because we, from then on, had, you know, and, and procedures in place. Okay. Okay, so... You see, that was, a, that was a real problem. That was a real problem in those days, that you, that you didn't, you know, you're responsible for these girls, but then, you know, there's, you didn't have any assistance. And there was a blockage at first. No, no, you cannot use these facilities. They're for men. Thank goodness we had two young men trainers who were willing to come and say, you know, yes, we, we'll provide one for you. It was, that was a real important movement. Next area is publicity, sports information distribution. Well, for many years, the coaches of the women's intercollegiate teams were the ones who wrote up the stories after the games, after the results of their team competitions, and they delivered them to the Vista, that's a school newspaper, and to the Edmond newspaper. A student athlete, usually a physical education major, wrote a weekly column called Women in Sports for the campus newspaper. The first student to write this was Virginia Peters. <laughs> she wrote the column from 1954 to 1957. After that, other students took over and started writing that. So we always had that column in there and then whatever story the coach had written to go in there. Um, there wasn't any pay, of course, for doing any of that. Uh, in the 1960s, some student staff money it used to get money in your budget for students to work in the, in the department. So some of our student staff money was used to hire a journalism major to come and get the scorebook after the game to write up the story, to distribute it where it needed to go, and so on. Uh, before Title IX, there was no assistance from the Sports Information Department of the University with regard to women's intercollegiate sport. It was, it was our job. They covered men's athletics. We were to provide the publicity for us. That's one reason that a lot of people don't think we had any sports until after Title IX. We had, lot, we had sports before, like I told you about, you know? But there was no publicity. You never saw anything. But look now on television. Who do you see on television? You see the OU women's softball team, you see basketball. Uh, in those days, no, didn't happen. What afterwards, Jerry? Well, I still wrote up the stories. I learned it from her. So we'd drop them off at the Vista, and I'd drop them off at the Edmund Sun with, when I had spare time, because <laughs> um, we were teaching a full teaching load also during all of this. Um, and like she said, once in a while, a journalism student would come by and write up a story for us. Um, we had to do statistics. In order to, like for instance, to nominate a player for a postseason award, we had to have their statistics. So the way, you know, I would take games, like I said, we'd play six games away on a weekend and I'd be sitting in my hotel room with the calculator putting together all these statistics. Um, again, in my spare time <laughs> when I wasn't grading papers in the hotel room. Uh, anyway, <laughs> well, I was, I was getting ready to say, so at one point I went to the computer lab here on campus and I told a gentleman there and he said, I will make you a computer program. And so um, I started feeding those statistics into a computer program, which was also a big help and a time saver. And I even got to where I taught a student manager uh, we did have student managers. Those were usually kids that would come out and not make the team, but they were such great kids, you'd say, would you like to be a part of the team? So I, would, I taught student managers how to load the statistics. So that was also a, a pretty good relief. And then again, one day, the sports information director, Mike Kirk, came by and he said, Jerry, 
how would you like it if I would take your book after every game and do your statistics for you and write up your stories and, and do all those things? It was, again, a godsend. It was wonderful. Uh, I, I did not hesitate saying, please, you know, you're welcome to do this. And Mike was really good because he even used to make these beautiful media guides for every sport. And you know, I still have you know, a copy of every one of them that he ever made for us. And, and I really appreciated that. That was another responsibility that was you know, lifted and, and so on. Okay, the next area is transportation. Now, early on, the women's athletes uh, did not have access to use of the one college bus. There was a college bus. Women's teams traveled to competition in faculty cars. Let's look about that for liability. The coach of each sports asked other women on the health and physical education department faculty to use their own personal cars to transport student athletes. Number of cars that were needed depended on the number of athletes who were involved in that particular sport. For example, we had to have more cars for field hockey because there are levered players on a team and substitutes, and more cars for individual sports today because you had 18 players going to play all these different sports. Faculty members had to show proof of car insurance, and at first there was no reimbursement for gasoline or mileage. All of this was out of the goodness of their hearts because they want young women to have an opportunity to compete. Yes, I'll drive my car and take half of the tennis team, of course, okay? Later, mileage of 10 cents a mile was paid to the drivers for the use of their personal cars. 1956, we got a 15-passenger bus named Old Blue. It was purchased by the university for some of the men's smaller teams and for women's sports. This is before Title IX. We had a bus, we had Old Blue. It was driven by a male student we only had that bus for four years because in 1960 it was wrecked. It had a wreck while transporting the Women's Recreation Association students on a camping trip. Fortunately, no one was badly injured, but the bus turned over, ripped off a bunch of guardrail poles, and so the bus was no. That was the death of Old Blues. In the middle 60s, the university purchased a group of 15 passenger vans for use by athletes, athletics, as well as other university groups. So from that point on, women's athletic teams traveled in those vans, usually with the coach as a driver. The cost of 15 cents a mile came out of the women's athletic budget and the women's, uh, of the women's physical education budget, and later there was a, a budget just for that. How about after Title IX? Most of our travel was also in the two university vans and either my, well, I drove one of them and either a senior or a team manager drove the other. Um, we did play games uh, within the state, but we also traveled out of state. Dr. Peters could tell you a story about talking to the vice president of administration one time about when we had a blowout, uh, our team had a blowout on the van and the field hockey team had a blowout on the van and she had to go talk to the administrator. But anyway, that's I had to story. say, we'd need better tires on those vans. That's crazy. We're going to have a bad injury. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we had, we played 40 competitions a year. Now in 2024, they play over 60 competitions per year. The team now travels by charter bus everywhere. Uh, almost all teams do charter buses. And of course, they have certified bus drivers. The coaches don't have to drive anymore. Um, when they have gone to national tournaments, they do get to fly. Um, our team in 1980 and 1982 both got to go to the national championships. One was in California and one was in South Dakota. We got to fly, but when we got there, we had two vans to travel around in as far as locally. Now the teams, when they fly to another uh, place for a championship, they also have a charter bus waiting on them to travel within uh, and around the, the places. Um, NAIA, when we went to national championships, the NAIA made the school pay for the travel. NCAA pays the way. And that's why a lot of times, if a team loses out on a national championship, they don't get to stay and watch the rest of it. They have to leave. 
uh, because the NCA is not going to pay for another night of hotels and food and things like that. <clears throat> the uh, UCO softball team made the national tournament this last year and they got to fly on a charter flight uh, to Chattanooga, Tennessee and did have to come back on commercial flights but I did get to go with them and it was my first ever national, I mean excuse me, my first ever charter flight on a plane but it was pretty fun. I'm thinking about whether well, there's another story that I wanted to tell <laughs> about what you just said. Oh, one of the reasons I quit coaching when I did, we drove the van, I was the coach, I drove the van, had, play, had the, all the players in there and everything. The time came when they all started wearing headphones <laughs> and they were listening to their own music as we traveled to Durant and back or to Alva and back. I didn't like that. I liked it before they had those and we sang and we told stories and we had all kinds of interactions, you know, going on. I remember a conversation one time on a bus, uh, I mean on one of those vans, and I'm driving and I'm hearing behind me one of the team members saying to another one, can I feel your hair? <laughs> now this is when the first began to have black student athletes. Now, that was a that was a real thing to have that happen. Can I feel your hair? Of course you can. And the and the thing, but things like that. See now now I'm I'm, I'm we don't have any of that anymore because we're all listening to our music. I said I'm I'm done. I'm not doing that anymore. That's no fun. Get on the bus and drive that way. Okay, now we're going to coaches. Women's teams uh, before Title IX were coached by women faculty in the health and physical education department. We we'll only have one more after this. Okay, they were not paid for coaching. They did not have any release time for coaching. The teachers either volunteered to coach and or <laughs> they were assigned, as Jerry was, to coach in, uh, in their area of expertise. Some coached two sports. All coaches of women's sports at Central before Title IX were women. 90% of the coaches of women's sports in the United States were women. Men apparently were not interested in coaching women's sports. They, no pay, little budget, lack of facilities, so on. And besides that, a lot of guys didn't think we really had intercollegiate sports anyway. They didn't think it could be classified as athletics. Also, as I said, many people in the general public didn't know or didn't believe that there were intercollegiate sports for girls. I can tell you that the players who practiced and practiced and who went and played games and matches and so on they knew that we had intercollegiate sports and we knew, the coaches knew that we did, whether anybody else did or not. Men's teams were coached by men who were hired to coach and assigned to teach in a health and physical education department. They were paid for coaching, they had release time for coaching, but they had to be paid from the ENG budget, which is an academic budget, so they had to teach. Some of them were good teachers, some of them were not. Some of them, they didn't want to. They wanted to coach. That's why they were there for. But they had to teach because that's where their salary was coming from. And so that created, you know, some problems. Some problems because you're trying to provide, if you have students coming to you and saying, my teacher hadn't been there for two weeks. There's a sign on the board when we go in. Say, just read the chapter or something. See, then I'm trying to handle that kind of stuff. Okay, that's all me, a coach. By the way, she assigned me nine classes the first semester I taught here, and I coached two sports. And the second semester I taught nine classes, and I coached two other sports. I now that, only, ha that <laughs> only happened one year because it started getting less and less. <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of those, I mean, a number of those were activity classes. They were. You know, she, she might have had three section of tennis a uh, uh, section of this and that, so it's not like they were. <laughs> it was, it was, and you know what? She did well, so she got to stay. <laughs> they were easier preps, I will say that, than my later years of teaching. But So the first five years that I was here, uh, all the sports were coached by women. Uh, with all the changes, we did drop some sports, and some of the ladies just didn't want to do the recruiting, and they didn't want—they didn't really like all the changes that were happening. 
The sports we had in the 80s were volleyball, coached by Mark Heron, basketball by John Keeley, tennis by Francis Baxter, and track by Paul Parent. We added soccer a little bit later on, coached by Mike Cook, and I was the only female coach, and I coached softball. And like I said, I love those guys. We still are very good friends, you know, today, and they were very nice to me, very respectful to me, so have nothing against them. It's just that I would have enjoyed having other female coaches along the way, too. When women began being paid to coach, more men started applying to coach women. This is still true today. There are many men who coach women, but not many women who coach men. When administrators started paying more for coaches of women's sports, many men began applying for those jobs. So in some ways, this has been a disadvantage of Title IX because the amounts of women coaches have decreased significantly. There are still many more men who are the administrators and do the hiring of coaches. There is a thought that if more administrators had daughters uh, or that there were more administrators who were females, there might be a few more female coaches. Or at least it might be something they might try to hire uh, uh, if, they, if possible. Central currently has 14 total sports. There are five for men and nine for women which includes now rowing and golf, as well as the others I mentioned. But of those 14 sports, only two are female. Female coaches, yeah. Title IX <clears throat> does emphasize um, equality in, in opportunities. And so you might say, well, why do now, why do we only have five men's sports and, and nine women's? And it goes back to that amount of particip participation because there are many, many participants in football, wrestling, baseball, and so they have to equalize, and so that's the way a lot of, you'll find a lot of universities across the country that now there are probably more female sports than men. Sometimes that also has to do with uh, the enrollment. If there's a larger percentage of, of enrollment of women as opposed to men, then sometimes, you know, there kind of is a, I might say a reverse discrimination type of thing or a reverse uh, support of the rule. Um, right now, Coach Cody White, um, he became the first ever paid assistant softball coach in 2013. So there were no other paid assistants up until, and as far as softball, I don't know about the other sports. Um, he is now the head coach. Uh, they won the national championship in 2013, and then our coach got hired away, and Cody became the, the head coach. He now has a full-time assistant coach, a, a part-time pitching coach, and a graduate assistant coach. Has a staff of five people. During Roger Webb's presidency at Central, he found money to pay for coaches and not teach. So um, now, and, and so, so now they're paid, the coaches are paid out of a different budget, not the academic uh, budget anymore. And, and we're not sure where that money came from or how he did it, but now all of the coaches do not teach, they just coach. And I think probably the majority of them want it that way because most people just wanted to coach and they didn't want to teach. Uh, I was not one of those. I loved, I loved as much teaching as I did coaching. Incidentally, several coaches of women's basketball at the Division I level right now are paid over a million dollars. Patty Gasso at OU, of course she's won seven national championship, but she is the highest paid softball coach in the country. Uh, I would guess when Coach Gasso retires in a few years that there will be plenty of men who will apply for her job because they know that the salary is well over one million dollars. Athletic scholarships. At UCO, there were no athletic scholarships for women before Title IX. During the time period from 1950 through 1969, the UCO women athletes were competed, it, competing in a limited way. I told you about the sports days, so it was that way, in four team and six individual sports. What did I say? We had four team and six individual sports, but none of those student athletes received athletic scholarships. Early on, women leaders in women's intercollegiate sports 
did not really request or push for athletic scholarships. There was an emphasis at the, at the time on what we called, like to call educational athletics, being a part of the total college experience. And there was even a desire to protect women students from the possible negative results of overemphasis on athletics. With more opportunities for women athletes to compete, things begin to change. In an article in the Vista School newspaper in 1969, I was quoted as saying, quote, competitive women's sports is the coming thing in athletics. Provided that women athletes are not exploited and their education comes first, women should be given athletic scholarships, end of quote. Another observation is that the governing organization for women's intercollegiate athletics at that time, called the Oklahoma Association Recreation Federation of College Women, had no rules about athletic scholarships or about recruiting. There were no rules because none of the member schools had athletic scholarships or recruiting, so they didn't have to have any rules about it and everything. Now we did, I will say, we did try to recruit some of you who are in academia you know we did try to recruit physical education majors because the public schools are very short. It didn't have enough physical education majors. We didn't give scholarships, but we tried to get them. And a lot of those physical education majors ended up being athletes. I mean, they were athletes. And so uh, uh, that's what happened. Okay, Jerry. After Title IX in 1978, the president informed us that we were going to start getting athletic scholarships and the women were going to get paid for coaching. So we're all getting real excited. <laughs> but wait. <laughs> we still had 10 women's sports and we said we thought we were going to get all these multiple amounts. We got four full scholarships given to our whole athletic department. So you take the equivalent of a full scholarship and multiply, multiply that times four, and that total is what we got. So the 10 of us, well, there were some, a couple of us that coached more than one sport, so that probably wasn't 10 full coaches, but we all got together in a meeting. And we sat down and we said, you know what, it's probably time that we drop some sports and that we put the money into, you know, lesser sports. So. That's when we kept volleyball, gymnastics, basketball, softball, tennis, and track. We dropped badminton, fencing, swimming, and field hockey that year. So we all decided, you know, we talked about it, we tossed it around, and so on. We finally came up with the number $300 scholarship. So the girls that got their first scholarships here at Central got $300. Now, you're shaking your heads because you're thinking that wasn't very much. Those kids thought they won the lottery because they could go tell people they were on an athletic scholarship. And we took those $300 and we gave a few here and a few here and a few here, so different sports, you know, depending on uh, how many numbers they had, that's where we did that. Um, as far as pay, I was told I would get $500 extra for coaching softball and $300 for coaching volleyball. And so I was going like, that's it? <laughs> I mean, so, so then I was told, well, you're going to get some release time. So I did get release time of two classes. I was still teaching six, I think. Um, but I got release time and I was told you need to count that portion of your salary plus the 500 and 300 as your your pay for coaching. So that's essentially uh, that. At that same time the men's program had 71 athletic scholarships, 37 in football, 14 in basketball, 12 in wrestling, tennis had two, golf had two, baseball two, track two. Um, so basically, this is pretty much um, how, and, and, and over time, you know, things changed. Uh, I will tell you that in 1993, there was a random pick of our school to have an Office of Civil Rights investigation. And that did occur here. All of us were interviewed, and uh, there were several things that came out of it that were really good. I got my own office because 
uh, all of the other coaches of men's head coaches of men's sports had their own office so now they said jerry you get your own office so coach baxter and i had office together for about 10 years and moved him out kept me pretty close by the athletic director's office you know so they could keep an eye on me uh but anyway so uh, got my own office, and we got the full equivalent of what was allowed at that time in scholarships. I believe at that time we were in CA Division II by then, and we were told that the, the full allotment of women's scholarships in softball was 7.2. Uh, no, excuse me, it was six, and we were raised to six scholarships. So I had six full scholarships in softball. A little bit over time, um, because of budget cuts, not just softball, but all, all over. Uh, I know that those budgets were reduced again at some point, but they were reduced across the board. It wasn't just softball. And Cody told me that now the equivalent is 7.2, but they still have about six. So in softball, they still have about six full rides. Okay, this is a, the big one, one of the big ones, finance budget expenditures. And we're going to skip the governing organizations okay. one, okay, because okay. we're running out of time. Yeah. For many years, as I told you, there was no designated budget for women's athletics. Money for some of the expenses came out of the women's physical education budget. That was supplemented to a small extent in the old days by women students who were members of WRA who were also athletes. They made and sold sandwiches in the dorms on Sunday nights because no meals were provided. And that was a source of a little more income for us to have to pay for our entry fees or our travel or whatever. There were no gate receipts for women's sports because no admission was charged. And, so there, and because there were not too many spectators early on. After a number of years, a budget was provided for women's athletics just as there was for men's athletics. There were separate men's and women's athletic programs, separate athletic budgets, and separate athletic directors. There was a men's athletic director, and then I, who had been the coordinator of women's intercollegiate sports, was given the title of the women's athletic director. Same job, different name. There's some sample budgets that I want to tell you about, and the reason I'm doing this is because this is after Title IX was passed, but before it was implemented. Okay, this is, it had been passed, but nothing was happening yet. 1974-75, the men's athletics and physical education budget was $151,000. The women's was $21,200. 1975-76, the men's athletic physical education budget was $172,000, while the women's budget was $27,000. 1978-79, the men's athletic budget was 330,600 for seven sports, and the women's athletic budget was 51,000 for 10 sports. So each year, the women's budget did increase, but it still remained a small percentage of the men's, and it wasn't until Title IX really began to be implemented that the budget situation changed. And it's not a matter of waste and money, but a matter of having adequate, adequate to provide what needed to be created. Coaches of women's sports turn in a budget request each year to the coordinator of women's sports. That included entry fees, travel, lodging, food, cost of official, special equipment needed for the season. The coordinator, me, then compiled the information in those requests into one overall request for women's athletics. That request was made to the Vice President of Finance of Administration here at Central. The first year I had to do that, I spent so much time working on that budget. Very carefully prepared it down to the penny, the very bare minimum that we would have to have in order to finance the women's program. I took it to the Vice President of Finance and I went over it very carefully and why this is important, why that is important and so on. After I finished, I looked at him anticipating the questions and the reasons why we couldn't do that. He immediately said, okay. I said, damn, I could have got more. <laughs> and he immediately said, that's right. And he said, you should always ask for more than you need because you know it's going to be cut. I learned a lesson then about how he uh, dealt with budgets and what his philosophy about that was. Now, 
There's one other time I went in to talk with him about a crucial matter. Some of you who are old time faculty around here, you know who I'm talking about. Anyway, he had a tape recorder on his desk. When I sat down, he reached out and turned the tape recorder on. I knew him a little better by then, so I looked at him and I said, I bet there isn't any main tape in that recorder. And he grinned and turned it off and said, no, <laughs> there isn't. But he said, you'd be surprised how many people back off and don't tell what they're going to tell or ask what they're going to ask if they think they're being taped. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I found out over time, I really liked working with that guy. I, I really did like him. He was tough, but he was fair. And you had to demonstrate your concern for your students and your dedication to your job and your willingness to compromise when compromise was necessary. Well, let's see, Jerry, let's move on to our ending because these what, the what, natives quickly, are getting restless. Real okay. quickly, I just want to say that, that we did, when we combined with the men's athletic program, um, the administrators across the country were told you have to find a way to finance women's sports. And most of them didn't like that. They didn't want to do it. And it did create a lot of animosity for a while between men's and women's athletics. We never wanted for money to be taken away from men's athletics. We just wanted what we wanted. And, we thought, and, and we thought it would probably take fundraising. We didn't want it to take away from the men. That was one of the reasons I quit coaching because we got to a point where I was gonna have to fundraise in addition to everything else I was doing and I just didn't think I could do it that way. So let's go to the ending. Okay, we've covered a lot of territory today. There's a lot more information and some other aspects we could have covered, but time is limited. We hope that you were able to get a good picture of the Women's Intercollegiate Sports Program here at UCO, its history, and how Title IX legislation affected it. Although the actual legislation was directed more at other types of equal opportunity, for example, teaching positions, you know, there, there, uh, there was a lot else involved besides just athletics, but it's one of the areas where it was affected the most, at least from the point of view of those of us who lived through that. There were many adjustments that had to be made when men and women's athletic programs were combined and the Title IX requirements had to be implemented. I was quoted at the time, remember this was in the heat of the battle, of saying the combination of the men's and women's athletic programs is like a shotgun marriage. Neither the bride nor the groom were very positive about this marriage and the changes that it brought, but it needed to happen. It did happen. We made it happen. And it happened primarily because of Title IX. So my conclusion is that Title IX, very instrumental in opening the door, offering the opportunity for women athletes to receive equal treatment in many ways in intercollegiate athletics. And Jerry, what's your final thoughts about it? Mine is the wow factor because I look back from the first time that I played tennis in junior high and high school as the only female sport, to seeing all the progress in the public schools, the universities, Olympics, and even professional women's sports, and it's been awe-inspiring. I sat in the Lloyd Noble Arena a few years ago, and there were 13,000 people watching a women's basketball game. Our UCO team played the first ever Olympic softball team in the Softball Hall of Fame Stadium as they toured the country in 1996 in preparation for the Olympics. Our university has built a softball stadium that last year was named the best Division II softball facility in the country. Last, uh, 10 days ago, I witnessed a $43 million facility opened at OU, the Love Fields facility. It is a state-of-the-art softball facility, uh, probably second to none anywhere. This is what Title IX has done for women's athletics. This is what 
I think little girls and little boys can live out their dreams by, by dreaming now that they can even go as far as the Olympics or professional women's softball team or other professional teams. So I sit here and say, I, I did that down at that softball facility. I was just going, wow, it is just something else. So that's what Title IX has done, and we would not be here if it were not for Title IX. I promise you that. Okay, we thank you for your coming to this presentation and for your interest in this significant part of women's history at UCO. We thank Nicole Willard for instigating this program and for the display they prepared. If you haven't seen it, go down the hall here and look at it. And thank you for inviting us to help tell this story and everything. And now we give it back to you. Happy spring. so much that was wonderful and I'm so thrilled that we have that on film I'm sure there's a million questions that y'all want to ask right uh oh we have one back here so will you guys share a microphone and then I'll so that, that we can get the question okay um, oh. <laughs> Is you have to say it, oh, okay. so I competed in cross-country and track and one of my frustrations sorry am I here, too loud here Okay. No, no, um, in high school. Um, although, well, I have, I have stories about being at UCO too. Anyway, um, but I always had the frustration that the men's distance running was longer distances than the women's, right? Like 5K versus 2 mile. And it's still the case now that, that men run a longer distance than women. Now, I always did better the longer the distance, the better I did. And I wonder if you can comment maybe on some of those inequities that still kind of exist in men's and women's sports? Because I'm sure track's not the only one. I'll tell you a quick one. During the, title, during the Office of Civil Rights investigation, um, I was asked the question, how many women do you put in a hotel room when you go on away trips? Four, two to a bed. And the guy said, the men don't do that. They sleep two to a room. And I said, well, that's not fair. And he said, well, it's, they'll tell you it's because the men are bigger than the women. Well, that's crazy. Now, what was I going to say? <laughs> oh, OK, here we go. Wait, wait, you, no, because I'll forget what I was going to say. <laughs> that happens as you get a little more chronologically gifted, you know, you begin to have those problems. You have to realize that way back, women, women didn't do any sports. They finally allowed them to do croquet. Yeah, things like that. Certainly not basketball, certainly not anything. Jumping, running, you would hurt your female organs and never be able to have children. Now, that sounds crazy to us today, but hey, that was a, a thing at one point, you know? Women were fragile, delicate little flowers. You couldn't run the same distance that a man could. No, of course not. So some of those things I think still, I mean, you know, yeah, we've improved a lot. When we first started playing full court basketball for girls, you know, and when I played, it was three on three, half court. Well, you couldn't cross that center line. You to, running on that end of the court was different than running on this end of the court, whatever it was. So, and, but then we went to four on four. We found out, yes, women could run that. We knew that all the time. We women knew it all the time, but that was society's uh, idea. And in Oklahoma, that was high school basketball coaches that kept that from happening for a long time. Those high school uh, coaches uh, who were coaching girls in high school, you know, they liked that three on three game. And I remember when I had to change, yeah, you, had to, you have to, can't just stand another one over there in the corner, you know, you, you've got to uh, use everybody, so you have to do some new coaching techniques and some new plays and that sort of thing. So I think society, pressures, you know, still there. I don't know if you went and asked now, you know, could you, they wouldn't let you run in the guys race, of course, but if you said, could we increase the distance here? I'm not sure how many of your fellow cross country ladies would want to do that either. You said you do better at a, at a larger distance, okay. So one thing I also was gonna say is that after the investigation and the people left, 
a little later, an athletic director said to me, you know, um, we were told that you all should start doing like the men and having your girls sleep two to a room. I said, so am I gonna get an increase in budget to do that? Oh no, we don't have that. <laughs> so nothing changed and there was no, in, there was no follow up by the Office of Civil Rights to see if we were b doing that. So nobody was policing it after they left, but some good things did come of it. But. Are there questions? I just want to make a comment. Oh, you have a question back here? Yep. I think we're going through a tremendous period of commercialization of university athletics, particularly men's athletics, that might even include unionization. What is this commercialization going to do to women's athletics? I don't know. I really don't. Some of you all might have a better idea. Be a, say a little bit more about what you're talking about, the commercialization. Right, okay. Well, I'm sure, you know, that's gonna affect women's athletics like it will men's. It'll, sure, it'll come to it. It'll come to it. You think some of those softball players that OU aren't gonna get real big um, money things coming in, you know, they're getting, uh, I'm going to be the representative for the Nike shoe, shoe people or whatever. I mean, there are all kinds of things like that that are, scares me to death. I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about what's going to happen in men's athletics as well as women's athletics. Because what's going to happen if that continues, I think, is we're going to start having, it, it'll be, we'll be farm clubs for the pro teams. And you'll get paid other ways. Now, right now, athletic budgets don't have the money to do that. So the only way it's going to happen is from these companies, the commercial people coming in and providing the money. That's how you're going to get athletes. You talk about scholarships. You know, it's where can I get the best NIL deal? What, what's, who's going to give me the best deal? So I'm, I'm sad about that, but I think it's coming. I don't know how we can avoid it. Yeah. In some ways, you know, all of our athletes go to school and they put in long hours and so they don't get a whole lot of spending money. And, and some come from better uh, finance families. So on some, on some ways where they get a little extra money, uh, I don't think that's such a bad thing. If it was equal across the board, uh, there are some universities that have a big donor pot that they're putting in and then they are dividing it up among all athletes from what I'm hearing. Uh, but there are lots, lots that are doing their own deals too. Um, I think when that happens, um, you know, the quarterback gets paid a whole lot more than the lineman and is that fair? No. Uh, it, it's just opened up a tremendous, you know, bag of worms in the whole athletic world that I don't think we've even seen the tip of the iceberg yet. So it, it, anything that happens in men's sports always comes to women's sports. It just may not be right away. But there are women who are making quite a bit of money within a NIL deals already. So. Uh, yes, um, UCO has a girls track team, but it doesn't have a, a males one. and. In high schools and colleges, somewhere areas, certain areas across the country, girls wrestling is starting to get up in popularity. Would UCL ever invest in a female wrestling team, or because we don't have a male's track team, it would probably even out the two sports if we were to get both of those. And, you know, maybe. We used to have a men's track team, and uh, they combined men and women's, and Coach Parent coached both. Uh, at some point, there was a decision made to get rid of the track, and it had to do, I believe, with a soccer professional possibility coming in. So that was done away with. Um, in, answer to your, in answer to your question about wrestling, any sport, it's not just that, but any sport, the athletic administrators have to consider what the competition would be. Uh, so, so it's not easy just to add any sport 
you know, there has to be consideration of who's going to feed into that sport, but also what the competition is and what the cost will be, you know, to travel or whatever. Wrestling is a very special sport in Oklahoma in the men's because you won't see many wrestling programs in the men's universities uh, or at universities that, 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 because most of them just don't have wrestling programs. So our wrestling program travels quite a lot, you know, uh, and so does like Oklahoma State and I think probably OU because there aren't very many programs. So a lot of that has to be, you know, considered about who, who is the competition going to be and is it going to be easy. When you have basketball and every other school plays basketball, that's not too hard to, to do. You've got competition and you've got it fairly close. But all those things, there's a lot more that comes into it. Where, where are we going to get the money to add that, you know, and, and that sort of thing? If I were a track person, I would be upset, too, that the girls got to have track and the guys don't. Even though the girls are having to do track somewhere else, we don't have a track on campus, do we? No, so they have to go to high school or somewhere to do that. My, my opinion about women's wrestling, girls' wrestling, is that's very hard for me to to accept, but you know what? It was very hard for them to accept that women could run full court basketball yeah, too. Right. So every, I've, what I've learned in my lifetime, all things change. All things change. You work through the battles that you, and you try to do the things, take care of the things you can take care of. And then if it gets to the point where you can't anymore, it's time to go do something else. So. Is, the, uh, are, is the funding still based on percentage, uh, proportion of participation? Per gender, is that how it's still based? I don't have access to that information, so I can't really tell you for sure. Uh, as Dr. Peters and I were getting ready for this talk, there's a lot of questions that that would involve some research of some things, but especially now, because she's been out of it a long time, I've been out of it a long time, and even though I stay pretty active with the softball team, like I said, I went to Coach White and sat down with him a couple of weeks ago and had to ask him some of those questions because I just haven't, you know, it's, I just haven't been on that side of it. I like to just now go sit and watch and coach from my seat in the bleachers. Uh, but I, I'm not privy to what's going on on the other side, so I don't, I don't really know the answer. And I'm not sure what the uh, attitude would be now, I, as far as I know. The athletic director that we have now uh, is a is a good guy. He looks out for women's sports. He's, you know, uh, I knew him when he was a little rat, gym rat running around here uh, when his daddy was was uh, working here. But anyway, he seems to be very positive about that about things like that. So I think you know, hopefully, uh, if we can get good people in the right leadership positions who have the right. Uh, at least what we believe is the right outlook, you know, on what? Yes, Gerald? I won't be back. I don't, I don't need that. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you guys both for being the difference that made a difference for so many of us. So I, I want to make sure that you both know that um, watching this as it comes through. But my follow-up question to this, I know kind of where we have came from. What do you see being the biggest hurdle as we move forward, even now? Well, and, and one thing I want to say is Stan Wagnon, who's our athletic director, has daughters and a son, but his daughter plays volleyball. So we, we have a good athletic director in place. <laughs> I think probably, Gerald, the, the portal, you know, that everybody hears about, uh, that's for men and women. I mean, it, that's no different. Um, I still see some improvement but we still aren't there. I mean, there still is not equality in a lot of things, in a lot of ways. Um, um, you could probably go interview any of our coaches and ask, you know, what they still need. And, you know, in some cases, the men's programs are still getting more than the women's. Um, but again, it's still that fight and of, of, but we've come so far and it's been, like I said, it's, it's just a wow kind of thing of how far we've come, but Title IX has not produced equality. Uh, so I know we have to keep working toward it. About the portal thing, to me that's one of the, I cannot, I cannot imagine 
that I would get a student here, a student athlete, give them a scholarship to come and play. They would play two years, and then they would, there's no loyalty. Then I, you give me a better deal, I'm gone. I, I'm sure that's not true of all of them, but you know, to me, the, the, the school is, is doing something for the students. The student ought to have a loyalty back to the school. Here you are down in Godibo, and you got a chance to have a college education here, and we're going to help pay your way and everything. Okay, now you get a little bit of publicity, and you say, sorry, coach, I'm, I'm off, and, and there's nothing to stop that. So I, I think that's one of the big problems. I will also say that I think parents have changed. Um, the parents of my young ladies were so happy that they were getting to play and they were so respectful. I didn't have to worry about parents, but you talk to coaches today and they're like, oh my gosh, it's the parents that are killing us. Um, I think, you know, where where we had athletes that stayed, got their college education, played four years and stayed here. Um, now the parents are saying, well, honey, if you're not getting to play there, let's just look and see where else we can get you to go. And, and many of them <clears throat> are staying one year. It's not even just two, but one year. I saw a kid the other day, it's been to four different schools. Where does their education fall in that? You know, do they get degrees? I don't even know at this point, you know, because I don't, I don't have privy to, to, to that information, but it worries me about whether they even are there to get a degree, but it seems like the parents now are pushing so much for the kids just to play because it reflects on them too, and so they just want the kids playing, and, and they're not as concerned. All of my girls' athletes were very concerned about their education, and I never recruited a kid here that didn't, wouldn't be able to get a degree here. Because if I was recruiting somebody and they said, I want to be in such and such a degree, and we didn't have it, I said, then you probably need to go somewhere else. As much as I would like to have you on the softball team, we don't have your degree program. So I would suggest you go here or here or here. But I don't know if that's true anymore. I don't know if they're in school to get an education at the college level. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for the questions. Thank you for everything. Uh, one more time. I want, you, I want to invite you to look at our exhibit over here. It gives you a little bit more information about timeline and some great pictures from our UCO women's sports. I also want to invite you to have some refreshments that are sponsored by the Friends of the Library. And um, thank you all for coming. Yeah. 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 Yeah.